Sappho, the original lesbian. If you know anything about poetry, then you've probably heard of Sappho, an incredibly influential poet from the Isle of Lesbos who probably lived around 600 BCE. The impact that she had on poetry and literature is massive. It's hard to imagine a world without her. But when you think of her, you probably think of her queerness first. It's been debated for centuries, but there's a lot of evidence that she was gay. She's the root of both lesbian from Lesbos and sapphic, which means love between women, and comes from her name, obviously. Um, although neither word came around until the 1800s. We really don't know much about Sappho, and I'll get into why later, but all we have to go on is the small amount of her poetry that we have left, quotes about her from the time, and secondary sources with questionable accuracy. One of them is called the Suda, a 10th century encyclopedia about ancient Greece. While its accounts of Sappho are very thorough, there's not much we can trust about them. So here's what we do know. She had wealthy parents, who were exiled for political reasons, and two brothers. She possibly had a daughter, but the wording is murky and it could have been her slave? Uh, she lived on the Isle of Lesbos, a small island in Greece, with a group of women. It's unclear exactly what their relationship was. Some say that they were her students, others that they were a cult. I kind of think that they didn't really have a purpose for being there and that they were just existing, but that's not backed up by much. She also allegedly killed herself after being exiled, but that has been disproven. The myth comes from a play written by Menander, uh, in which she throws herself off the Lucidian cliffs after being rejected by a fairy man named Phaon. Interestingly, that story parallels a story about Aphrodite, who also threw herself off the Lucidian cliffs after Adonis, her lover, died. And that's kind of all. Among the things that she invented are the plectrum for strumming the lyre, which she was known to play, the mixolydian, a very common and important musical scale, the sapphic meter, or stanza, which consists of three lines of 11 beats and a concluding line of five beats, and lyric poetry, a style of poetry that talks more about personal emotions and is usually written in the first person. That's why we know more about her emotional and mental state than we ever will about who she actually was. Her poetry was also incredible. One of my personal favorites are fragments 105a and b, uh, as the sweet apple reddens on the high branch, high on the highest branch, and the apple pickers forgot. No, not forgot, were unable to reach. Like the hyacinth in the mountains that shepherd men with their feet trample down, and on the ground, the purple flower. It's very, like, short and simple poetry, you know, she doesn't really say much, but she expresses a ton with what she does say. Plato also seems to agree with me, quote, Some say the muses are nine. How careless. Look, there's Sappho too, from Lesbos, the tenth. Here he's referring to the nine muses, a term for the ancient for the nine ancient Greek goddesses of poetry. I mean, not just poetry, but that was a big part of it. Um, she became known as kind of an honorary muse because how gifted she was. She was seen as almost divine in her writing. Strabo, a Greek philosopher and historian, was also a fan. In his Encyclopedia Geographica, he says, And along with these flourished also Sappho, a marvelous woman, for in all time which we, of which we have record, I do not know of the appearance of any woman who could rival Sappho, even in a slight degree, in the matter of poetry. So pretty high praise all around. Okay, so we've established how incredible she was, but why do we know so little about her? There are a few reasons. The first is just that over time the papyrus that she wrote her works on has been lost or damaged. We've salvaged what we can, but there's not much to salvage. The second is equally blameless, mistranslation. There were several, several Greek dialects around the time that Sappho lived, and it was pretty hard to translate one to another. Her particular dialect happened to be Aeolic, one of the hardest ones to translate, so that's cool. Um, the third, however, makes me personally very angry. Um, many of her works were destroyed over the years. The Library of Alexandria held nine volumes, and all of them were burned. Pope Gregory VII also thought it would be super fun to destroy a ton of her works in 1073 CE. For perspective, we have two full poems left, and of the estimated 10,000 lines of poetry she wrote, we have 600. Um, an analogy of her poetry that I saw once and always liked was to fragment 31. He seems to me equal to the gods, that man. Whoever he is who opposite you sits and listen close to your sweet speaking and lovely laughing. Oh, it pulls the heart in my chest on wings. For when I look at you, even a moment, no speaking is left in me. No, tongue, break, tongue breaks and thin fire is racing under skin. 
and in eyes no sight, and drumming feels ears, and cold sweat holds me, and shaking grips me all, greener than grass. I am and dead, for almost I seem to me. But all is to be dared, because even a person of poverty, who honored me by giving me their works, and I know that some of that doesn't really uh, make sense, but bear with her because it was probably mistranslated in a few places. So anyways, she sees this woman from across the room and is enchanted by her. Just from a small glimpse, her heart beats fast, her mouth grows dry, suddenly she can't form words. The man talking to her, assumedly her husband, seems divine to Sappho for the simple reason that he has the honor of speaking to her. Similarly, we see a small glimpse of Sappho's works, 600 out of 10,000 lines. But just from these, we're starstruck, or at least I am. And the people in ancient Greece, who were able to read all of her poetry whenever they wanted and actually hear her perform them, they seem godly to us. I briefly mentioned her queerness earlier, but let's talk about it a bit more in depth. Her attraction to women has been debated, questioned, and studied for centuries. Funnily enough, ancient Greece didn't really care about same-sex relationships, so at the time it was probably the least thing, interesting thing about her. And now it's the most talked about, but let's talk about it anyways, because I think it's important. If you've read her poetry, then you know that she talks about women a lot. There were three women that came up multiple times. Anactoria, found in fragment 16. But that reminds me now, Anactoria. She's not here, and I'd rather see her lovely step, her sparkling glance, and her face, than gaze upon all the troops in Lydia in their chariots and glittering armor. Uh, Athos, found in fragment 96, Consolation for Athos. But now she is conspicuous among Lydian women, as sometimes at sunset, the rosy-fingered moon surpasses all the stars, and her light stretches over salt sea equally and flower-deep fields. And Gongola found in I Beg You, Gongola. Come back again, I beg you, Gongola. Reveal yourself in your garment, white as milk. Oh, what desire forever around you, my lovely girl. This charming garment stirs her who beholds her, for she who expresses this reproach to you is the goddess herself. Cyprus born, whom now I invoke. Simeon Solomon, a gay painter known for painting queer relationships and who was eventually arrested for attempted sodomy, also painted her with a woman named Irina in Sappho and Irina in a garden at Mytilene in 1864. This painting is very well known in lots of queer spaces and for good reason. It's a beautiful painting. Sappho holds Irina in a tender embrace. Both of them lounged on a bench in a gorgeous garden. Their lips are inter inches away and Sappho's eyes are closed, and Irina's looking longingly. Sappho's lyre lays on the ground near them. Despite all this evidence that she loved women, and for the record, I know that uh, that painting isn't exactly evidence, but I still thought I'd include it because it's very good. <laughs> um, despite all that, lots of historians still haven't accepted it. Here are some of the things they've cited as evidence of her heterosexuality. Her works weren't autobiographical. She was writing about or from the perspective of others. They have no problem, of course, accepting that she was writing about herself for all poems, not about women, but suddenly things change when they get gay. They've said that Lesbos was a school and that she was writing about her students. I'm not really sure I get that one, honestly. They've said that she was a priestess and she was writing about goddesses. That's possible, but there isn't really any solid evidence for it. It's kind of just a loose theory. They've cited, cited her fictitious love for Phaon, the fair man for the play I mentioned earlier as proof of her... Uh, straightness. Um, but my favorite piece of evidence is the idea that probably originally originated as a joke, which the pseudo misinterpreted as reality. It's written that she had a husband named Kirkless of the island of Andros. Fine, right? The only problem is that name literally translates to penis of the island of man, so I find it kind of hard to believe. Sappho was gay. Can we please stop making up ridiculous ideas as to why she wasn't? I mentioned earlier that Sappho and Arena in a garden at Mytilene is very well known in queer spaces. You'll find that this is a common theme. Small pieces of evidence for her queerness becoming the object of obsession in queer spaces. That's not a judgment. As a queer person, having the proof that you're not alone, that someone who came before you felt the same way, it's unparalleled. Natalie Barney was a perfect example of this. A wealthy woman in the late 1800s who lived openly as a lesbian and when she found Sappho, became obsessed. In my research for this podcast, I found many scholarly articles say variation of the same phrase. Sappho's queerness has often been debated and studied, but it's not what matters. We should be focusing on her poetry. Natalie Barney is why this phrase frustrates me so much. 
because her queerness does matter and it should be studied. I know I said earlier that it didn't matter to ancient Greece who she slept with, but the thing is, it matters to us now. Maybe if we lived in a society like she did, where it didn't matter who you loved or who you slept with, I would agree with those scholars. But for now, I'll fight for her queerness to be remembered for people like Natalie Barney, who saw and see themselves in the Tenth Muse. One of my favorite poems by Sappho is a surprisingly short one, Fragment 147. It too has been obsessed over in queer spaces, and rightfully so. In such a short phrase, an entire lifetime of emotion and love and pain is packed in. This, to me, is the beauty of her works. She only needs a sentence to express what takes hundreds of pages for others. In Fragment 147, Sappho writes, Someone will remember us, I say, even in another time. And Sappho, you were right. Even in another time, someone remembered you.